Back in the noughties, when slimy new Labour was still in power, I was active locally with No to ID, which was the official resistance to one of Tony Blair's periodic attacks on the free society that had fed and expensively educated him all his days. We were a small bunch of mismatched, but on this issue at least, ideologically aligned people for whom the idea of being forced to show your papers by any number of state actors was inimical to the very idea of a free society. In rotation, every other weekend, we set up our stall, hand out leaflets and collect signatures that, as far as I'm aware, never actually went anywhere. Maybe they got sent to Downing Street, but maybe they didn't. I don't recall, if I'm honest. But for all its parochial hometown small fry resistance, it worked. Or at least it was part of what worked. We won the argument, or maybe they lost it. Or maybe, which is entirely possible, they realised that they could keep tabs on us through the wondrous new iPhone, the first of the newfangled smartphones. And that is possible. But if it is, it's only because they realised that technology could get them covertly, what they couldn't get overtly. They couldn't win the argument as if it were a debate. To be blunt, they couldn't win it fairly. They were probably advised by their techie types, just bide your time until the technology catches up. To quote Paul Weller, they're never ever going to make you stand in line. They're just waiting for the right time. And so, since the resistance was too stiff, the argument was lost and the amount announcement was made that the introduction of compulsory ID cards was to be withdrawn. If I remember correctly, it was made with the caveat that they were unworkable, rather than they were an illiberal intrusion into a country that had never been a papers please society, like in the Soviet bloc or any number of tin pot dictatorships around the world. But tyranny never sleeps, and there is always another generation of control freaks and pathetic peeping toms in the wings, ready and waiting to peer salaciously into the nooks and crannies of our private lives and impatient to pry open our secrets for the whole world, or at least them, to see. And although they very definitely are pathetic, just like cowards, they are far more dangerous than they, than they look. Because although winning the argument remains paramount when arguing with power, and in matters of principle, one is almost always arguing with power, coming out on top in debate is rarely sufficient on its own. There are so many things about our society that most of us thought were settled that have turned out to be anything but. And they seem not to, and, and they seem not to be settled, not because there is anything wrong with the principles themselves, because principles by definition are rules that apply to everyone in every situation, but because they upset some people in some situations. Freedom of speech, for example, should be universal, since as every human being has a voice, each voice should be given equal importance. But if one asserts that someone's speech is deemed more valuable than, other, than another's, perhaps because they're not white, not male, not gay, and not upper or middle class, then the freedom of speech of white, upper class, straight male can be safely ignored, or at least downgraded. This, of course, just becomes an argument about power. You already have power, and that's not fair, because I want it, and so I have to make your voice less powerful to even the score. In doing, in doing so, of course, I make my voice more powerful, which for me is no bad thing. A corrosive combination of white guilt and a lack of confidence in Western society has allowed the principle of freedom of speech to be compromised. And as I've said before, once a principle has been compromised, it's only a matter of time before it ceases to be a principle at all in any meaningful sense. So instead of freedom of speech, we now have hate speech laws. 
give an inch on principle and you might just as well give a fucking mile as it is with the principle surrounding vaccine passports. You'd think, wouldn't you, that the Nuremberg Code would have been a sufficiently hallowed set of principles, drawn up as they were, soberly and with great seriousness by some of the finest minds at the time, in response to the most catastrophic corruption and perversion of the Hippocratic Oath by one of the most advanced societies on earth that no civilised person would ever dream of even questioning it. You'd think. But in an article by Matthew Paris in The Spectator entitled The Libertarian Case for Vaccine Passports, his opening phrase, in principle, I'm in favour of, in principle, I'm in favour of vaccination passports. And I don't understand how, again, in principle, anyone could be against the theory. So that can only be described as bold. I'll leave a link in the description. But as suggested by the title, he argues that supporting vaccine passports is, or should be, the libertarian position. And he is implying that, for the purposes of this argument only, libertarianism is a good thing. Now the thing about this article in which Paris does make some good points. The article is here, if you've got, you know, is here. Is that it did force me to think a bit harder about my objections to vaccine passports. I would describe myself in a social sense, if not an economic one, as a libertarian. I've never considered myself in any kind of a romantic way as any kind of rebel. In fact, I'm suspicious of anyone who describes themselves so, believing it to be no more than a kind of affectation or a fetish. But I do bristle increasingly when I feel I'm being coerced into something against my will. I wish I didn't have to rebel. In fact, I'm with Brett Weinstein when he says he wants a society so good that he can be a conservative. As a gay man, Paris firstly undermines one of those who are opposed to the passport, Ian Duncan Smith, by viewing his libertarian credentials through the prism of his patchy record on gay issues like reducing the age of consent of homosexuals and gay marriage. Which is fair, I suppose, considering one of the basic tenets of libertarianism is for the state to stay out of the bedroom. But one wonders what Paris might have thought of HIV passports at the height of the age epidemic, as we're on the subject, since they would disproportionately have barred gay men like him from enjoying all the benefits of society. Strangely though, he doesn't make that point. But what he does go on to say is, the passport proposal aims to liberate, which is a seductive phrase, as are the very words of vaccine passport. They quite obviously sum up the idea of all the things that you could do. Go to the pub, the theatre, the cinema, the football, the cricket. If only you take this very small and insignificant vial of chemicals and allow it to be injected into your body. Just do this, this very small thing, and the world will open up to you again, just as it was before. Some people even call them freedom passports. Like I say, although Paris is no Lord Sumption, who was also not completely dismissive of vaccine passports, despite his valuable words against the larger issue of lockdown, this article did make me think. Paris says that none of the opponents of vaccine passports are suggesting that we open up cinemas and pubs to all comers now, regardless of the threat to public health. Aren't they? I am. But even if I wasn't, and that there really was a threat to public health, I think the thing for me is that it is a refutation, as if a further refutation was required, of the refrain that we are all in this together. It suggests that we're all in this together, so long as we all think the same. We're all in this together, so long as we all believe that this virus really is the Black Death, or AIDS even. We're all in this together, so long as we all take the vaccine. 
we're all in this together, so long as we ignore the fact that the vaccine has only been a thing for six months, when vaccines are usually tested for years before they are rolled out to the general public. It suggests that because Paris trusts the vaccine and is now allowed to sit in the theatre, that I must also trust the vaccine in order to do, do the same. But because maybe I don't trust it, or maybe, which is closer to the truth, that I trust my immune system to be able to deal with COVID if I were to get it. And that maybe I consider the probably small risk of having an adverse reaction, or worse, to be greater, much greater as it happens, than the risk to myself from getting COVID. I support Paris's choice to take the vaccine if he wants to take the risk that I don't want to take. And I'd be quite happy to sit next to him in, in the theatre. But he, by contrast, is insisting that I take the same risk that he's taken, or else I will be banished from society. And the thing is, he is taking a risk, whether he acknowledges it or not. But many will say, I may be infectious, whereas he is unlikely likely to be infectious to me. True, but if he has been vaccinated, whatever I do should make no difference to him, assuming the vaccine does what it says on the tin. But his libertarian take begins to slide towards the end into naked utilitarianism. He believes that those who have been vaccinated, which will surely be the majority, can occupy the moral high ground and insist or coerce or force to be more accurate, the rest of us to take it too. Now, and I've made this point before, when you have a vote and you lose, you have to accept the defeat. It's called loser's consent. Without it, democracies cannot function, as we saw with Brexit. But in this, but in this instance, the majority, the winners if you like, are demanding that loser's consent, in this case, amounts to the surrender of their bodily sovereignty. And that's a bit fucking rich, isn't it? Going home and accepting that you're going to be governed by someone you don't like, or even that you despise for the next five years, is one thing. But being given the Hobson's choice of take this untested and experimental cocktail of chemicals or you cannot participate in society anymore is a bit extreme, wouldn't you say? Paris winds up his article with the assertion that it is those who support vaccine passports by seeking ways to open up that are the freedom lovers. Again, he has a point as far as it goes, but he glosses over the fact that his freedom is conditional, conditional on agreeing to take the vaccine. Now, he doesn't see it that way, since being eager to take the vaccine means that there is no element of coercion in his decision. But for some reason, despite being relatively intelligent, he doesn't see that other people have completely rational concerns about taking it. And since the encouragement, such as it was, has now turned into veiled threats about not being able to participate in society, it is hardly surprising that many are experiencing vaccine hesitancy, to use their much repeated phrase. And you get this a lot when illiberal or coercive measures are, measures are mooted. People of, shall, I, shall we say, a fascistic tendency are quite happy to force their policies on others. Taking surveillance as an example, people routinely tell me that they are quite relaxed about surveillance when it, when it is perceived to be watching others. But when it's focused on them, all of a sudden they begin to get all uppity about their right to privacy. My neighbour two doors down from me is having a running feud with my next door neighbour to the extent that they have both installed surveillance cameras supposedly to record each other's misdemeanours. The cameras two doors down aimed as, aimed as they are at my next door neighbour's property are theoretically capable of also recording my comings and goings and despite my complaints they remain. But the other day I gave my new drone a little test flight from, the, from my back garden, which could theoretically have compromised his privacy. 
and you should have heard his complaints. Of course I shouldn't have done it and resolved not to do so again, but he was unwilling to admit his own theoretical invasion of my privacy, just as people are fully supportive of endless electronic surveillance, suggesting that your criticisms must have something to do with you having something to hide, somehow become rather coy if you ask them their passwords or try to get access to the photos, photos or the internet search history. Because that's fascist for you. Because I support something, so must you. Because I have submitted to the vaccine, so must you. And they'll say it's for the greater good. That's their rationale. And the greater good has, of course, been decided by them and not by you. And they demand safety. Safety greater than the 99.5% survival rate that their immune system delivers, even if they're elderly, but otherwise healthy. And if you're not prepared to collude with that, and indulge them in their extreme demands, then you must be banished from society, obviously. But where the hell has this presumption of absolute safety come from? Why do they even feel entitled to it? Why is it they feel as if it is their God-given right to be safe? And even if it means destroying the lives of millions of their fellow compatriots, just so they can be safe, then so be it. Where do these pussies get off on that? When this country was facing a real threat, a real enemy, the average man and woman in the street, and average mind, average, not exceptional, the average man girded their loins, stiffened their sinews, and bloody well faced the threat. And for the most part, willingly. Over the course of the Second World War, the bomber crews, to pick just one example, had a less than 50% survival rate. That means most of them were killed. And yet these people seem to think that they deserve to be safe. Why? What have they done to deserve that safety? The overwhelmingly safe and secure country that I grew up in was paid for by the deaths of half a million of my compatriots, not to mention the endless numbers of Russian, American and other Commonwealth lives. I definitely do not think that I deserve safety. What I think is that I have to have gratitude for the safety that I do have. Safety that was entirely unearned. What I think is that I now have to earn my keep in my free country by keeping it free. What I think is that the least that I can do to honour their memory, the very least, is to face this threat, this puny threat, with some semblance of dignity and stoicism try to be an example to others and to pass on the free society to my children that was bequeathed at great sacrifice to me. What I think is that I, that I should not be selling out the freedoms of my compatriots whilst I quiver behind the sofa like a spineless coward. Paris describes himself and his ilk as the real freedom lovers, safety lovers more like. Stay safe? Screw you, Matthew Paris. You can keep your damn safety. I'm going to stay free. <laughs>